I'm Dr. Mike Milligan. I have a phenomenal treat for you right now. I'm here with Dr. Lloyd Rudy, a very famous cardiac surgeon. Lloyd, thank you so much for being with us. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Rudy is the, is the cardiac surgeon who discovered that it's a thrombus that causes ischemic events, the, the heart attacks and strokes. I'll get back to that in just a minute. But he also, in his talk yesterday at the AAOSH meeting, the American Academy for Oral Systemic Health, bringing dentists and physicians together, he said something that really blew me away. What I said was, in all of the heart valve replacements that were required in my patients, right. and, and in my partner's patients, so right. I'm not talking about just me. Yeah. We were a group, and, and everybody was doing the heart re, uh, valve replacements. But what I said was, in my experience, that having to replace a heart valve for infection, mm -hmm. in my experience, was uniformly secondary to oral infections, okay. to abscessed teeth. Okay. To Fair dental enough. caries, to infection in the mouth that then was transformed into the bloodstream and then infecting the heart valves. Okay. And also, even more important, in those people that we had replaced the valves already for rheumatic valvular heart disease and for degenerative heart disease and so on. When those prostheses, those valve prostheses that we put in got infected, right. that was a disaster because, okay. because it's a foreign body. Right. And once you get an infected foreign body, that is a Dacron sewing ring or whatever, it's almost impossible to sterilize that valve with okay. antibiotics. Okay. It's just a disastrous situation. Okay. And so, and again, the connection between oral infection and the infection of their heart valves right. was, in my experience, just almost uniform. It was not a cut on the leg that was infected or a, you know, an ear infection or something. Right. It was, in my experience, almost all the time, an abscessed tooth or severe dental caries or periodontitis, just an awfully infected mouth. Right. And, and we, way back when we started doing this, we recognized this problem very soon and took measures to have these people have their dental problems fixed before we replace the valve, if at all possible. Right, if it was right. not an emergent operation right. to take to fix this man, a person's valve, right. first thing we did was look in the mouth. Yeah. Way back, wow, that's, you know, I mean, the first valve replacement yeah. was 1961. Yeah, yeah. I was fortunate enough to scrub as a trainee as a assistant resident uh -huh. on the second successful valve replacement. That's how far back I go. Okay. Actually, I went further back than that. But <laughs> no. Uh, but um, but it very soon became clear that there was this incredible connection. Connection between the oral and the between and the, the heart. oral and, and so the cooperation between physician and dentist for me. Right has gone back 40 years. Wow, okay. Uh, really, yeah. Yeah. And, and I just insisted that the patient, when I saw him in the office, if that's where I saw him, go to his dentist, get his mouth cleaned up, put him on intravenous antibiotics prior to his operation, I mean, just covering every aspect right. of that. Right, right. So, that's why I'm so interested in being here. Right. That on top of the fact that I've recently learned um, knowing 
that I've done these thousands of coronary bypass operations and in every one of them you look at the the diseased vessel and it's angry and red and inflamed. you know inflamed mm -hmm. that that arteriosclerosis is an inflammatory disease right and we kept saying wow look at that i mean you know what's causing that why is is it the body's reaction to the fat deposits getting into the blood vessel wall or is it something else and now, now we're, we're learning, learning right that, it, that it's maybe the infection first. In the mouth. Yeah. It's well, it, in the mouth or anywhere, anywhere but right. an inflammatory problem. Right. Chronic inflammatory right. problem, as well as the ranch diet and the smoking and the obesity right. and the metabolic syndrome and all the other things. Right. But probably the chronic inflammation is as important or more important than anything. Really? To all of those yeah. Right. I mean, and uh, so I'm just fascinated by all this stuff. And here I, I mean, I'm not even in practice anymore. <laughs> I've been retired for a number of years. But I've um, become associated with Brad Bale and Amy Donane. Right. And uh, have become their patient. I mean, I've follow their dictum right I, i'm going I, to become their patient very soon I I, just yeah right Absolutely. Get, getting tested and i told right. them hey i got an 18 year old i want to live to be 100 you know there you go brad can right. i live to be 100 well i'll, I'll do my best, do my best. Well, I, you know, I, <laughs> so um so in that connection i've been to several of their preceptor ships mm -hmm. they always ask me to get up and talk about the night with the clot. Right, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. Uh, but um, that's why I'm here. Okay, well, wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> well, uh, go ahead and talk to us now about that night with the clot. Okay. All right. Um, well, we really did not know the exact mechanism of the sequence of events in a myocardial infarction. Right which was taking millions of lives. Right. We had to do everything we could to not only fix these end stage problems by doing bypass grafts and so on, right. but how can we prevent this? Right. We knew way back we had to do preventive medicine. Uh -huh. We knew we'd be going broke doing just end stage as a country uh, therapy right okay because it was costing you know 30 or 40 thousand dollars a pop for right. for these operations so my partners and i decided just looking at the results of putting a patient in the coronary care unit right and the large heart attacks myocardial infarctions were taking 18 20 percent of the people away I mean that the, the 80 percent of the people 70 percent of the people were walking out of the hospital well that's right. not very good that's result not right that's not good enough right we knew that our elective coronary bypass operations had a mortality rate of less than two percent okay big difference so then we started talking to our cardiologists and we said, what about operating on people when they come in with their myocardial infarction? If it's soon enough. Right. If within they're not hours, in extremis. Within six hours? Yeah, we, yeah, well, we just sat around and we right. just arbitrarily said, hmm, what should be the cutoff time? Yeah. What's the magic golden time of maybe right. doing this? Right. And we arbitrarily chose six hours. Right. As it turned out, after doing a thousand of these, that that happened to be just the, the right, right amount of time. Right, right. Now, why? Who knows? Well, who knows? But, but we knew that later on, when we got really aggressive and started doing people 8, 10, 12 hours out, that their results were not near as near good. As good. Okay. Because probably the cell death of the heart muscle was just too far 
gone or sure. whatever. And then they start having more complications and so on. Rhythm problems and so on. So, so we started doing these. Right. We finally convinced the cardiologist to let us do these. It kind of reminded me back in 1960 when we were able to do valve replacements on these rheumatic fever, uh, rheumatic heart disease patients. And the only patients we got to operate on were three quarters dead. I mean, they came, yeah, they came down in the operating room in oxygen tents. Right, here, do something. And, and, and <laughs> okay, do what you can now. Right. We've done, it's a little cardiologist. Late. We've done all we can, so right. now you guys get it. Right. And, right. and so here we are again, starting out with, Behind the okay, right. cardiologists put them to bed and do all these things and 20% of them die. Okay, give us a chance. Yeah. Just give us a chance. Yeah. So the first 100, we lost one patient. Right. That's and so lo guy. and behold, we then became this cooperative effort. Right. Like the cooperative effort we're trying to do now between dentists, dentists. and doctors. Right. It was between surgeons and cardiologists. And we present, we wrote this up and we happened to have a, a real brilliant writer and statistician and so on by the name of Mar Dr. Marcus Thurwood who followed us around and, and he you'd find him in there at two o'clock in the morning looking through all of our charts and getting all the data together and so we wrote this up and um, and to be perfectly honest most people thought we were nuts <laughs> I mean they're operating on an acute heart attack? I mean, that's unheard of. Yeah. yeah. Well, it worked. they saw the first, pa the first paper. Well then, let me make a long story short, we kept doing them. Right. We kept doing more and more of them. Right. And it was a nighttime effort because heart attacks occur at night right. when your heart rate's the slowest and your blood pressure's the slowest and your artery. Well, Again, so we still did not know the mechanism of the closure of the artery, did we? That caused the heart attack. The, yeah, right. I mean, we knew it was a fat deposit, right. a, a cholesterol deposit, and so on in most instances, but we really didn't know the progression of events. Right. So one night at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm doing a patient who had what we call a widowmaker anterior descending coronary obstruction yeah. with the whole front of his heart being in jeopardy. Right. And Marcus came, came in that night, two o'clock in the morning, there he is, and um, he convinced me that we had, when I opened the artery to put the graft in, we had to find out what it was going on in right. there. And so we slipped a little catheter called a Fogarty catheter, a very tiny little catheter up there, and then you blow up the balloon the size of the artery and you pull and see if there's a clot or right not there. a clot or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So we did that. And out again, fortuitously, a perfect clot. I mean, the, the reason it was perfect was that an intact clot starts uh, at a certain diameter and then slowly trails off into okay. a tail. Right. And Marcus just, he just was so excited <laughs> that we got this thing out of there <laughs> and he's back there taking pictures and he's already writing the article for the New right. England Journal of Medicine. Right. We're going to tell the world it is a clot yeah. because here's a living patient, not post-mortem, not, right. uh, here's a living patient having a myocardial infarction right. and it was a clot that yeah. was doing it. Well, how the clot form and all that? Well, you know, Brad Bale and Amy Donine have shown that it's the exact mechanism of how that clot comes to be. Right. And so Marcus 
wrote it up and got it into the New England Journal of Medicine, well, what was the impact of that? And all I can tell you is what a lot of cardiologists have told me. Right. Because I really didn't recognize this at the time until later, but what it told these guys was that if this guy comes in with his myocardial infarction, you give him something that'll dissolve that clot and you can reverse that right, right then and there, you know, an hour after this chest pain starts or 15 minutes or however close to the hospital he is. Absolutely changed the thinking. It, it really, thing. throughout the planet. Right. Just totally changed uh, yeah. everything. Yeah. I mean, that's what I'm told is that that gave, gave them the freedom right. to treat these people with clot busters. Right. Right. And to, and, and there's nothing more exciting. Well, there's some things more exciting. But it's very exciting. <laughs> to give somebody something in the vein and have his electrocardiogram normalize and his blood pressure start to come up and all the right. good things happening right. Right. when that heart muscle goes, <gasps> yeah, it's more oxygen. Yeah, you bet, huh? you bet, absolutely. Well, so we ended up then becoming um, very well known throughout the world. the world. I mean, we gave don't gave be, talks. Don't be so humble. You've been well, <laughs> absolutely we, throughout we the world. We gave right. talks in yeah. South America and Europe, and I just had a wonderful experience giving a talk in Europe because I could look up and it was like the United Nations. Because here's the Spanish guy and the Swiss guy and the <laughs> German guy all mocking every word I <laughs> said about that, and then I got back. And Mike Wallace gets me on 60 Minutes. Right. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So right, right, right. Um, it, it's been a real run for me. Yeah, a, a, a very exciting well, life. You've saved I so mean, many <laughs> lives and changed the way this has been treated, and uh, it's 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 fabulous. And thank you so much for all you've done. Well, right. you're very welcome. I, you know, it was just my job, right? <laughs> and, well. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Rudy, and for telling us these stories and, and, and the significance of the dental community involved with this, and then the history of how you came about to change the way, uh, you know, heart, hearts are looked at and, and the treatment of that. Well, I think, I think that this new society is going to help change things, too. Oh, absolutely. Because it's going to be involved with the diabetes and the metabolic syndrome and, and the blood vessel disease and all that and if we can get that improved by dental right by cooperating with the dentist and so on even more than in the past then we got because I personally believe and I got to stick this in this okay put it in cut it whatever you want to do okay. but I firmly believe that the future of medicine has got to be prevention. And that's what I Absolutely. think we're doing here. We are going broke taking care of the end stage disease. Dentistry as much as that's been, been my job. Yeah. That's so much what we try to do in dentistry is prevention. And absolutely, I think a lot of uh, medical care has been treatment oriented, but they're getting more and more into prevention as well. Yeah. You so. So anyway, it's been a pleasure talking to you and Dr. Rudy, thank you so much. You're for very being welcome. With us.